I heard scripture reading today is Isaiah 9, 6, and Ephesians 2, 13, and 14. Oh, I didn't realize you had that one there. A voice of one calling, for to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who once were far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barriers that dividing wall of hostility. The word of the Lord. I need to God. And here comes Pastor Arlene. Good job. Thanks, Paul. Sorry, everyone. I changed the scripture reading from the one that is in your pamphlets or your bulletins. So that one, the one that Paul just read is more fitting to today's uh, sermon. So, all right, let's pray. Dear God Almighty, thank you so much for Advent. It is a time where we prepare our hearts to uh, remember the coming of our Messiah, of our Lord Jesus Christ, coming in the flesh, um, coming near to us, making his dwelling among us. Thank you so much for that, Lord God, and we just pray that we will be able to prepare our hearts um, this season for Jesus, um, but we know that this is also a way of life, uh, even past December. So, Lord, we just pray for your divine empowerment that we will be able to continuously prepare for the second coming. Uh, we thank you, Jesus, for the transformation you've already done in so many of us and the ones that you continue to do as well. Uh, in many of us. We thank you in the name of Jesus. Amen. So as we were saying from the beginning of the service, this is the time of year where we focus on the themes of hope, peace, joy, love, based on the practice of Advent. And today's focus is peace. But it kind of feels ironic to be talking about peace, just like Jan was mentioning in her prayer, um, because the world doesn't feel very peaceful right now. I began to think on a global, local, um, relational, and individual scale. I'm talking about globally. It will be two years in February when Ukraine and Russia have been at war. The total number of Ukrainian and Russian troops killed or wounded since the war in Ukraine began, since the war in Ukraine began, is nearing 500,000, according to U.S. officials. Furthermore, it has been two months since the Hamas and Israel war. October 7th has been described as the deadliest day for Jews since the Holocaust, with more than 1,200 people in Israel, mostly civilians, killed in a single day. Following Hamas militants' deadly attacks in Israel on October 7th, Israel has struck back, killing more than 11,000 people, according to Hamas-run Gaza Health Ministry. These two wars get the most coverage in the media, but there are other conflicts happening in Afghanistan, Congo, Colombia, Iraq, Mali, South Sudan, Syria, Yemen, and many more other places. This is on a global scale. On a local scale in the city, we are still seeing, what are we seeing at Allen Gardens? Encampments, parks full of tents. The shelters, are they full or is there room? There's no room. We know what Jesus was experiencing when his family was looking for a place um, to be when they were supposed to be taking a census for Joseph's family. When, when um, Mary was about to give birth, we know what they were going through because there was no room at the inn. There was no room at shelters. 
we, when we have a family who comes to us or an individual who comes to us at YSM and says, I have nowhere to go, I need a shelter, I brace myself because I know that calling central intake, they're gonna say, keep calling, keep calling every single week. One family, they already told us in August, it's gonna be in January that you might get a place. That is crazy. There is no room at the inn right now. There is no room in shelters. There are high prices on rent and groceries. Even for working people, finances are tight and they are living paycheck to paycheck. Millennials were told, if you go to school, if you get a degree, if you get a good job, you're gonna have this and you're gonna have that. This is the generation of millennials who did that but their goal of owning a home is unreachable in the city. Although Canada has become more accessible to new immigrants, those that are being offered permanent residency or citizenship are leaving Canada to go back home because of how unaffordable the cost of living is here. The dream of prospering in North America is shattered for many. Now, if we move beyond the, lo the global and the local and look at what's happening just immediately around us, peace may feel very far away. Maybe there is discord in your family. Maybe you're experiencing drama in your friend circle. Maybe you live in a neighborhood with poverty and crime. I received a call saying, Pastor Arlene, please pray for me because there is a man across the street who is dying from an overdose. This is very normal for people in our congregation who are in neighborhoods that are at risk every single day. Your neighbors may not be the type that you can borrow a cup of sugar from. They are the ones that you might have to hide from. Then, looking past our immediate context, and we look at our own hearts, maybe some of our hearts are filled with pain, worry, conflictive thoughts. We avoid the news because we already have so much going on in here that we don't even have to look at the news to feel afraid, to feel worried. It's just too much to bear for many of us. Peace seems so far away. It almost seems unfair and unrealistic to talk about peace today. If we were followers of the world, peace would be a faraway concept. But aren't we glad that we are followers of Jesus and not of this world? The world wishes for peace. What do all the Miss Universe say? What do they wish for? World peace. To the world, peace. Right. To the world, peace means the absence of conflict, the absence of war. But what does peace mean to the Christian? Are we to understand peace in the same way that the world understands it? What do you think? No? I'm hearing some no's. Right. I'm going to read you a couple of verses about peace, and let's see what we can draw from these truths. John 16, 33, I have said these things to you, this is Jesus talking by the way, I have said these things to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Jesus is acknowledging that we're going to go through tribulation in this world He's not saying, la, 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 we're living in this cloud. There's not going to be any tribulation. There's not going to be any problems. We're not Ned Flanders. We're not those type of Christians who are like, nope, I don't see any evil. There's nothing around me. Nope. Jesus is acknowledging that there is going to be tribulation in this world. And in the midst of that tribulation and that suffering, that we should be encouraged by him overcoming the world and finding peace in him. John 14, 27, Jesus once again says, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give it to you. 
Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. Once again, Jesus is telling our hearts not to be troubled or afraid because he gives us peace in a different way that the world offers it. The world offers no conflict, no war. That's their version of peace. Jesus' peace surpasses that. Before Jesus returns to earth to redeem and renew his creation, we will struggle with living in places of conflict. We will experience conflict in our relationships and in our heart, in our mind, and in our body. And like our guest speaker, Bill, said last week, there's two ways he spoke on hope. He said there's two ways you can find hope. One, you can wait for a spaceship to come and take you away to a place where you can find hope. Or you can learn to find hope here on Earth in the midst of darkness. I'm going to say the same thing applies to peace. As Christians, we're not waiting for a spaceship to come and take us. <laughs> But we do wait for Jesus' second return. Are we going to wait until Jesus comes back to experience peace? Or are we going to find ways to obtain peace in the midst of conflict here on earth? The answer doesn't have to be either or. It could be both. I personally need hope in the future coming of Jesus so that I can have hope in the present. I need that. I need to be thinking about that Jesus is going to return. Everything will be okay. He will redeem everything. He will make everything just. I need to know that for me to have hope and peace right here, right now. It's not enough for me to just conjure up some peace right here. I need to have that future hope because that is what's going to give me hope here, right now on this earth. Isaiah prophesied about the coming Messiah. For a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. This is a prophecy hundreds of years before Jesus was born, that he would be the Prince of Peace. The Messiah coming would be the Prince of Peace. Jesus is the Prince of Peace. Jesus will bring the peace that this world is longing for and waiting for when he returns. But Jesus is also our peace here on earth during our tribulations and our suffering. Ephesians 2.14 says, But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far away have been brought near to God by the blood of Christ. When it says the blood of Christ, it's talking of the blood that he shed on the cross. It's talking about the sacrifice of his life that he made for us, for the world. For he himself is our peace, who has made the two groups one, talking about Jews and Gentiles, and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility. Jesus creates peace between you and God, and grafts you into his kingdom. You cannot come to God the Father. You cannot go to heaven without Jesus. And he gives you peace with God. But the peace doesn't end there. He doesn't just make peace between you and God the Father and that's it. Okay, you're done. Nope, peace doesn't end there. It continues and it grows in our relationship with God. Question. Can you be in two places at once? No. no? Are you sure? No. no? Not, physically. Not physically. Right. Okay. Emotionally and physically. Uh, so, sorry. Emotionally and mentally. Yes. Okay. Very true. Very true. I like that answer. So technically, no. In, uh, physically, we can't. But with technology now, we can be at home and tuning into a friend's wedding in another country, or we could be part of a conference in another province. I went to my friend's baby shower last week uh, in, a front, in another province. There is only, this is the only way to be in two places at once. As Christians in the spiritual realm, we are in two places at once. 
Did you know that? When you become a believer in Jesus Christ, you enter into the already and not yet kingdom. You become part of the kingdom of God now here on earth. You become a child of God and an heir to the promises of God. You also become part of the not yet kingdom, which Jesus will bring about when he returns and glorifies us and makes a new heavens and a new earth. We need both as believers. We are in both. The future completed kingdom gives us hope today. 2 Corinthians 4, 16 to 18. I love this passage. Therefore, we do not lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, we're getting sick, we are aging, we are dying. Yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles, right now what you're going through, it's just light and momentary in the light of what we're going to go through in heaven with Jesus. You're not going to deal with all the crap that you're dealing with here in your body, in your mind, with people, in your neighborhood, with the traumas that you've been through, with the global scale of suffering. It's not going to be like that. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen since what is seen is temporary. Your suffering right now is temporary. And in the light of eternity, it's gonna be like, oh, that was just a blip. It felt really long back then, but in the light of eternity, it's just gonna be a blip, a little bump. What is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Jesus calls us to a different understanding of peace in this world as we await his return. He calls us to await his perfect peace, which is coming at his return, and he calls us to make peace as we wait. I know I've used my story of having COVID many times, and I apologize for that, <laughs> but it was a significant time in my life where I grew so much. For those who don't know, um, my husband and I in 2021, before the vaccines rolled out in Canada, uh, we ended up getting a very significant strain of COVID. And the strain that we had um, was, uh, it affected our oxygen levels and they were lowering and lowering and lowering. Paulo says that I, it affected me first and then it affected him. Um, but Paulo says that, Paulo's my husband, he, he was saying that I was like, in, in Spanish he says, little pollito, which is a little chicken, a little chick, it's just so helpless. I was just like, you know, I couldn't talk, I didn't have energy, I didn't want to eat anything. Um, and I slowly, I didn't know, uh, the lack of oxygen was killing me. And if I would have gone to sleep, uh, I would have died in my sleep. Uh, and same with Paolo uh, later on. Um, and thankfully, because I had been already admitted to the emergency room a um, few days before, the emergency room was calling me, a nurse from the emergency room was calling me every single day monitoring my oxygen. So I had to put that little oximeter on my finger, tell her um, what my oxygen levels were. And when she saw that there was no change and it just kept lowering and I hardly had any energy to breathe, she said, you need to come into the hospital. You need to be admitted right now. And so she, she reserved a bed at that time. Um, Paolo couldn't come with me. And so I had never been admitted to a hospital. I know many of you have had that experience. Um, I can't even imagine because I had never had that experience. So for me, it was very scary. And so I said, you know, going out of my apartment, I was like, oh my gosh, I'm gonna be admitted to a hospital because of lack of oxygen. And am I gonna see Paolo again? Am I gonna see my nieces again? Am I gonna, my nieces are very special to me. And I just said, am I gonna see my nieces again? Am I gonna see my family again? Am I gonna see people from work, people from church again? I don't know. And it was a very scary time for me. But immediately as I was having those thoughts, as I was leaving my door, going to the hospital with Paolo holding on to me because I could barely walk as well, um, 
I just heard God saying, stop thinking like that. Begin to have thoughts of life. Because what I was having was thoughts of death. I was already accepting that I, my life was going to end soon and that I wasn't going to see people. And God was saying, stop. Have thoughts of life right now. And so then I began saying, I will see Paolo again. I will see my nieces again. I will be okay. Jesus is with me. God is with me. Make me brave. Make me strong. Make me courageous, Lord. And that's what I had to do. I had to correct my thoughts in that moment when I heard God correct me. I needed to be intentional about the situation I was going through. I got to the hospital. The nurses asked for my name. And I couldn't even give it to them. Thankfully, they knew who I was <laughs> because um, the other nurse from the phone warned them that I was coming. But my oxygen level was so low, I couldn't even speak. They put me in a wheelchair, wheeled me to my room, and they put an oxygen mask on me. And about 10 minutes later, I said, Arlene. They were like, what? I was like, my name is Arlene. <laughs> that was the longest introduction. <laughs> but I'm glad they understood. God was with me through that experience. And I felt God's presence so strongly during my time there. I was there one week. And I saw Jesus in all the details. His presence filled my hospital room where I stayed. And I truly felt at peace. Whatever you're going through today, God is with you in the valley and in the moments of darkness. Philippians 4, 6 to 7 says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. He already knows what you're thinking. He already knows what you need. Bring it up to him. Yes. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding. Do you think somebody who's dying should be having peace? Yes. I was like, you know, to the natural world, to the person who doesn't know Christ, they might be like, you know how many people ask me, are you scared? They would text me and send me messengers because they knew what was going on, and they were like, are you scared? That was probably the top number one question that they would ask me. And thankfully, I wasn't at the time. God was giving me peace. And the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Romans 8, 6, for to set the mind on the flesh is death. That's what I was doing. I was setting my mind on death, the moment I was leaving my home. But then God said, hey, correct that right now. But to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. Isaiah 26, 3, you will keep in perfect peace those whose minds are steadfast because they trust in you. If you take a look, I put these all, these three verses in one screen for a reason. If you take a look at these verses, does it look like we are to take a passive role in receiving peace, or are we to take an active role? Active. Will we just open up our hands ah, and receive some peace from God? <laughs> maybe, maybe. Or do these verses imply that some, there's something we must do to obtain peace? God invites us to be active in the process of obtaining peace. Isaiah here encourages us to put our trust in God to experience God's peace. Romans here encourages us to fix our thoughts on truths of the spirit to experience peace. Philippians here encourages us to pray when we are anxious and to be thankful to experience God's inexplicable peace. During that time in my near-death experience, I experienced God's peace because God corrected me and I had to obey him, not to listen to my thoughts of death during that moment. I had to choose thoughts of life that brought me peace afterward. And even after I was sent home, I don't want to make this a romantic story, even after I was sent home, I struggled with long COVID. It's called long COVID when the effects of COVID affect you afterward. Um, I struggled with long COVID for about 12 months after. I was in rehab for many months afterward, and God continued to give me peace as my body recovered. It wasn't easy. It wasn't pleasant. My symptoms were painful. They were annoying, and they were frustrating. But I had God to give me hope. 
I was able to be a witness even to my counselor because as part of the package of the long COVID rehab clinic I was in, you got a counselor. And so I got counseling um, and she was surprised that my experience made me feel closer to God. I was able to witness to this counselor. Peace is a fruit of the spirit. Can anyone name the fruits of the spirit? <laughs> Good, very good, yes. But one of them is peace. The fruit of the Spirit are characteristics that we develop as Christians as we grow into the likeness of Jesus by the power of the Holy Spirit. It's something we work toward with God's help and grace. Peace is one of the things that we're called to work toward as a Christian. Here's my crazy mind sometimes thinking in a diagram. Um, these are areas where we can't find peace right now, which I mentioned at the beginning of the sermon, global, local, relational, individual. When it comes to peace, which one do we have control over? Global, local, relational, individual? What do you think? Individual, okay, good. That's the one I'm hearing. Do we have control over the peace that happens in global affairs? Probably not us here in this room. Maybe, maybe those who are in politics, maybe those who are closer to making decisions of you know, war and all those things, they do. But probably not us here. We can pray about it. I love that. Yes, I love that. So we have some sort of influence, but we might not have control over it. Good. Thank you for saying that. Do we have control over the peace that happens locally? Right. You can have influence through your votes. You can have influence. Everyone's actions could help to create peace in our neighborhoods and our city. If one person can't control their anger and flips out violently on someone on the TTC, it creates fear and violence in the city and on public transit. Do we have control over the peace that happens in our relationships? Family, friends, and neighbors that we know. Yes. We can. Yes. Yeah. Somebody said some of us. Did I hear you say that? Good. That's a hard one. Let's be honest. Yes, we might be able to have control over that, but some of us have very difficult people we're living with or that we relate to on day to day. Matthew 5, for those who do have difficult relationships like that, Matthew 5, 9, blessed are the peacemakers for they shall be called children of God. Romans 12, 18, if possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Hebrews 12, 14, strive for peace with everyone and for the holiness, for, and for with holiness, without holiness, no one will see the Lord. We are to make every effort to live in peace with others. This can be really hard if we have conflictive, drama-filled people in our lives. But your response to their drama is crucial. You can match their conflictive energy and therefore spark a fire between you two. Or you can take a deep breath. <sighs> Control your reaction, walk away, or give a gentle answer, which is not easy. Let's be real. It's not easy, but it's worth it to create peace. And I just want to make something clear because I work with, when every time I talk about boundaries, if we do the boundaries course and I have Christians in that class, they struggle with boundaries because they think that being a good Christian means being a doormat to everyone. They think that being a Christian, good Christian, means that you can get slapped around by everyone. You are the head and not the tail. 
I just want to make it clear that being a peaceful person doesn't mean that you become a doormat for people to walk all over. As a person of peace, you can address things gently and tell people how their behavior is affecting you. Unfortunately, addressing things does cause others to become defensive and they may create more turmoil. This is, this is my issue, I always have to address things. <laughs> I wish I didn't, I wasn't like that. There's people who cannot address things and they, are, they live in perfect peace and I'm like, I have to address it. <laughs> um, sadly, it does create turmoil, you know, because the person doesn't wanna hear it. Um, but I wanna let you know that peace doesn't mean having weak boundaries and letting people walk all over you. Making an effort to live in peace can also challenge others to live in peace with themselves, with God, and with others too. Last but not least, the last area is the one that we have control over, individual. We may have influence, like we talked about, over the first three categories, but the last one, individual, is the one where we can create the most peace. Will you allow others to create peace in you according to what they do to you, or will you be active in creating peace with the power of the Holy Spirit? Mm -hmm, the latter. God has given you the responsibility of managing your own body, thoughts, and feelings, even if others hurt us. Healing becomes our responsibility. I've learned that we don't need the people who hurt us for our healing. I'm gonna say that again. We don't need the people who hurt us for our healing. Sure, their apology could be helpful and their restorative actions can be helpful too. And I'm gonna accept that. I'm gonna accept their apology and their changed behavior. But it's the work that we do to heal that's truly gonna restore us. God has given you a spirit of self-discipline and the fruit of self-control. You also have the presence of God living in you, which means you have everything you need living inside of you to live in peace. You have God. You have the Prince of Peace living inside of you. That means that peace is not far away from you. This is why we can feel peace in the midst of the storm. We can feel peace in darkness and in turmoil. Turn to Jesus today and give him every area that doesn't feel peaceful. I'm gonna give you a moment right now to think. These are the areas, God, I give to you that don't feel peaceful. Is it your family? Is it your body? Is it your neighborhood? Just give it to him right now. He already knows it anyway. We give it to you, Lord, and we ask you, Prince of Peace, to intervene. Give us that inexplicable peace that surpasses all understanding as we give these things to you, Lord. Amen. Amen. Today for Advent, we prepare our hearts by focusing on peace. But making every effort to live in peace is an everyday thing for the Christian past Advent. For we will one day see perfect peace when our Prince of Peace makes all things new. Amen? Amen. Let's go into a time of worship as a response.